Good evening to you all. So, so my name is Richard Sheath. I'm here in Berlin. Um, Phil, you're, how's Hong Kong today? Hong Kong is uh, very, very warm. <laughs> uh, I've just had to crank up the air conditioning. So yes, it's fine. <laughs> very good. Right, well, um, we'll just do a few introductions whilst we're waiting for a few other people who have signed up to join. So Sarah, my assistant, if you could possibly just put up the presentation, please. Very good, thanks Sarah. So again, good evening to you all. Um, just uh, let's uh, do a few introductions. So Sarah, if you could just go on to the next slide, please. So, as I said, my name is, is Richard Sheath. I'm a, a director of Independent Audit Limited. Uh, we'll talk in a second a bit more about who we are as Independent Audit. Uh, but as I say, I've got quite a few years of board evaluation experience. So that's uh, why I'm talking about this today. And the second of our webinars for Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a webinar on virtual meetings, and that is recorded. Um, so some of you will have received that, but if uh, anybody would still like to get a copy of that, then please uh, contact Phil, whose uh, contact details will appear later in this, uh, during the seminar, this uh, webinar. Um, Phil, would you like to just introduce yourself? Sure, thanks Richard, and welcome. Uh everybody to uh, to this webinar. Thank you for joining us. I've been with uh, Independent Order since June 2019. I'm Business Director for Asia. I've been in Asia for 30 years now. I'm currently based in Hong Kong. Uh, prior to uh, joining International um, international Independence Audit, sorry, <laughs> Independent Audit, I was the Chief Executive of, of a professional government's body in Hong Kong and China. And about 10 years ago, I founded another international body a global body which now represents about 80,000 governments professionals and immediately before joining uh, independent audit I was the uh, director of a board portal company so board governance has been a big part of my life for about 20 years and uh, so and now I'm doing even more of it. Yes. <laughs> Thanks Phil. So uh, Sarah please. Just a, a few words on uh, independent audit. We've been doing board evaluations now for some 18 years and are amongst the leading board evaluation companies in uh, certainly in the UK where we started and where we've mainly been operating for the last few years. But it's, um, it's become much more of an international uh, perspective for independent audits as we opened offices in Brussels and Dublin recently. So it's pushing out further into Europe, but also through Phil, we're very keen to work with organizations in the Asia region. So we look forward to having an opportunity to do that. But over those years, we've, um, we've seen many different types of boards in action. We've conducted some 350 or so board reviews, including for more than 50 of the FTSE 100. Um, so, and what we'll explain today is the, the approach we take to board evaluation. But more, this webinar is about how board evaluation needs to be adapted uh, in the pandemic environment and really how the equation around board effectiveness is changing. So we'd like to help you think through what your boards might need to be doing differently in order to work effectively during the crisis and, and later, once we emerge from the, the most serious part of this pandemic. So um, let's just move on to the next slide, please, Sarah. What we're going to do in this webinar is, first of all, we're going to do a quick poll. Um, those of you who joined us two weeks ago, remember we did a quick poll. And then we didn't quite get to sharing the results of the, at, the end of the, at the end of the webinar. So we'll get that right today. Um, but let's do, just do the quick poll questions. If you could just answer these questions and then we'll share the results with you. And then we'll come back to the same questions at the end of the webinar to see whether your opinions have changed. 
So, could you please just answer these two questions? Firstly, how much do you think the pandemic crisis will affect the way the board works in the future? A lot, a bit, or not much? And the second question, has the crisis changed the likelihood of you conducting a more in-depth board evaluation this year? Yes, much more likely, possibly a bit more likely, and no, no change. So if you could just answer those two questions and then we'll have a quick look at what you're telling us. So Sarah, what are we, what are we seeing? What are people telling us? So, uh, everybody is saying uh, that it will change the way the, uh, the board works in the future. And everybody is saying that uh, it's a bit more likely that there will be an in-depth board evaluation this year. Okay, thank you. That's, that's interesting to see such a unanimous picture. So uh, if you just close that poll, um, then what we're going to do is I'm going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes on board evaluation post-pandemic. Uh, it won't just be me, Phil will uh, share a few thoughts as well. And then we'll allow around 15 minutes for, for questions and answers. So, um, We'd be very keen to get here your questions and answers. So if you could um, enter your questions and answers in the Q&A facility on the Zoom toolbar, that would be very helpful. Then we will pick those up as we get into the question and answer session. So Sarah, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So what we'll be doing, first of all, is um, mentioning uh, the independent audit cartoons. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the thought leadership material that we produce, uh, especially our monthly bulletin, e-bulletin, which is called The Effective Board, uh, which we're very happy to sign you up for. Those of you who are familiar with that will see that uh, independent audit, we like to use cartoons to communicate some messages around governance. We try to think, well, we like to think that there's uh, some humour in corporate governance, although it can be a bit difficult to, uh, to find at times. But uh, anyway, so uh, if you, when you have contact with us, you'll see a few cartoons coming through. Um, anyway, we'll be discussing today what a good evaluation looks like. What are the factors we typically look at as board evaluators? And thirdly, what has changed with the crisis? Thanks, so. Sarah. So I thought it'd be worth just spending a bit of time helping you um, understand what's been happening in the UK uh, over the years since the concept of board evaluation was introduced into the corporate governance code. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that might be playing out in different parts of Asia. Um, but just to recap and to uh, really re describe what's been happening here, because the UK Corporate Governance Code and the guidance connected to that over the last 15 years really has shown the way or set the standard around board evaluation. And so it's, it's useful to understand what's been happening in this market. Firstly, just to remind you that under the UK Corporate Governance Code, or, you know, maybe this is new for some of you that haven't uh, needed to look at this, the, the concept of the code is comply or explain. So it's not a 100% formal requirement. But having said that, obviously uh, institutional investors and regulators are expecting companies to largely comply. So it's not a formal requirement, but virtually everybody does. Uh, and if they do something a bit different or maybe miss uh, their 
a particular part of the cycle, then they, they can explain in the annual report. But generally, this difference has become a bit superfluous because most people would choose to comply in any case. This code is for all listed companies to have an externally facilitated review every three years. And in other years, as a minimum, conduct a self-assessment. So they're required to undertake a board evaluation every year, every third year being an independent externally facilitated review. Um, and the approach they take actually has to be explained in their annual report. So although the requirement is not that the results of the review are included in the annual report, um, although some can't choose to do that in, these in, in summary, uh, the requirement is for the, the approach to be explained and for the name of the independent reviewer to be included in the description. Um, and the, the evaluation is intended to cover the board itself, all of the board committees, and the individual directors. And obviously that includes also the chair. So this is what is supposed to happen every year and every third year being externally facilitated. But uh, several years ago, the code was complemented by some quite detailed guidance, which was ar around board effectiveness, which is aimed at promoting discussion. Um, and the, the, the guidance promotes or pushes the review, the evaluation to include direct discussion between the reviewer and the people participating, the participants including elements of management. Um, and it also encourages observation of meetings. So that guidance, even though it's not formally part of the code, is actually changing board evaluation practice across uh, UK companies. And now this has gone even further with the government uh, actually looking at the possibility of introducing a code for board reviewers. Uh, following certain corporate collapses, there was concern that uh, many different people are performing board evaluations uh, and it's not clear what their credentials are or what they are actually looking at and what standards they're applying to their board reviews. So the government was concerned about this and asked the Institute of Charter Secretaries and Administrators, ICSA, in the UK to conduct a, a review and a consultation process in order to develop a possible code for board reviewers to follow. Um, and this is expected to be released sometime this year with uh, political changes in the UK and with the pandemic situation that has actually been delayed. So we are expecting a, a code to be produced, which will largely be voluntary and largely be around reviewers explaining on their websites what their approach is, but also companies committing to conducting their reviews in a particular way. I won't say any more at this stage because the final version has still not been released. Um, but it's just an indication of the way board evaluation is continuing to develop in the UK. Uh, it really is no longer optional. The elements of it, be it uh, interview-based, meeting observation, paper review, are becoming um, much more part of the code. So what, what are the trends that we're actually seeing? I'm just going to run through what we're seeing in the UK and then Phil's going to just make a few comments on how some of this actually ties into what we're seeing amongst uh, companies in, in your region. But first of all, uh, we're seeing a lot of general acceptance now that observing meetings is a standard part of board evaluation. Of course there are some exceptions and of course there are some meetings where Clients, although they're allowing observation, might ask the reviewer to leave a meeting at a particular point for a particularly sensitive matter under discussion, uh, which isn't a problem from our point of view as observers. Um, but it now, 95% of the time, I would say, clients are comfortable with meetings of both the board and some of the committees being observed. Um, at the moment, that means, of course, that we're joining the meeting virtually in the same way that everybody else 
is, but then we're experiencing it in the way they are too. So uh, that's no problem. Um, another trend is we're seeing a lot more focus on review of the papers, uh, the board papers. For us uh, as independent audit, that means looking at about a year's worth of papers so that we see a full 12 month cycle of the information being provided to the board and to the committees. And again, board paper review is becoming quite a common, almost normal part of a board evaluation. The three year cycles I, I've mentioned uh, in terms of what is required under the code, but what we're also seeing is companies starting to plan on a three year basis. So instead of just every year deciding what are we going to do this year for our board evaluation, they're starting to think further ahead, partly so that they don't have to answer that same question every year. And it, of course, it comes around very quickly, but also so they've got a, a more structured cycle to how the board will develop. Um, we're seeing better discussions across the board. I mean, so meeting with more people, uh, executives, as well as just the people who are directors. Uh, we're seeing more better and fuller descriptions in the annual report. As I mentioned, this, the requirement is only for the actual process to be described and the independence reviewer to be named, along with a statement of whether or not the independent reviewer has any other commercial relationships with the board or with the company. Um, what we're beginning to see though is fuller descriptions also in terms of the outcome of the evaluation. Obviously not in detail, and of course it's guarded. Nobody's expecting anybody to uh, be exposing all of their difficulties in the annual report, but just giving an, an indication of what the board sees as its development priorities. And you know, good, good reports are now beginning to include indications. And that, really helps the users of annual reports and makes it more convincing as an explanation of how the way they've taken a rigorous and thorough approach to the evaluation. And that's important because we are seeing increasing institutional interest. I and mean, of course, it's always important not to exaggerate the extent to which institutional investors actually look at governance in detail. But uh, we are seeing a greater interest from the institution, some of the institutions at least, and also, of course, much greater interest from the regulators. So a big change in the last few years here has been the way in which regulated entities, particularly in the financial services market, are being basically told by the regulators they have to undertake board reviews and that on a cyclical basis that has to be an independent external review. And uh, there's little room for compromise in the eyes of the regulator. And just the other trend I just want to mention is that we're seeing a lot of non-listed entities, non-listed organizations undertaking board evaluations. Obviously it's required of listed companies under the code, but what we're seeing is a lot more subsidiaries, particularly in the financial services sector, uh, but also non-corporate entities undertaking board evaluations as they follow the good practice being established by the, the listed companies. So that's what we're seeing in the UK, and that obviously is finding its way into countries that follow the UK quite closely. So Phil, what, is there any particular aspects there, particularly I think around meeting observation that you want to comment on in relation to? Uh, I, I, I would love to. I would love to. I, I just just to sort of backtrack a little bit on the uh, in Singapore and Hong Kong and Malaysia, we have a slightly different approach. Hong Kong is probably the only major financial center in the world that is, doesn't require um, uh, board evaluation in terms of, uh, it's not mandated in the code of corporate governance, it's just a recommended best practice. And that's been sort of uh, an issue of debate for some time in the corporate governance world. And it really, we really are quite a long way behind um, compared with other major financial centers in, in demanding that the boards are reviewed either internally or externally. A lot of the leading companies do it, but uh, it really does need to, we, we, we need to step up to the sort of the plate here and, and, uh, and make that a, a requirement. In Singapore, it is a requirement. In Singapore, uh, it's, um, as in Malaysia, you, you can do it internally. It is recommended that I think every, you do it externally every three years, certainly in Malaysia, 
the Malaysian Code on Corporate Governments, uh, I think it's section 5.1 under their guidance section, states that each company should have an external uh, board evaluation um, at least once every three years. And I know that the Kuala the Stock Exchange has that in there. Well, they, they have these wonderful things called board charters that every listed company has to state, say, this is what we do, this is how we operate and whether we do a, an, a, an external board evaluation or not. Uh, and that's, that's a great idea. And the Stock Exchange in Kuala Lumpur actually does one every three years. As they do in Hong Kong, but it's again, it's not mandatory. Um, it's just something that they, they sort of do on a voluntary basis. And of course, it's the large companies that do all this. Okay, yes, that's important, but really it's the sort of other companies that should be, should be doing it. That's where it really is important because that's where we get the most breaches of the code on corporate governance. So uh, we, we, we need to sort of um, do what we did with ESG and make it mandatory. Uh, financial institutions under the Hong Kong Monetary Authority in Hong Kong are mandatory. They have to do a, a, a more compliance-based one. But, uh, what about this question of uh, meeting observation, Phil? Do you think this is meeting observation? Uh, is well, when we talked about this initially, and when I talked to uh, other company secretaries in Hong Kong and Singapore, we sort of all said that this was not going to be happened for a while because of cultural and family issues and uh, because so many businesses in Hong Kong and uh, in Asia are family owned and or dominated and that would be a non-starter. I've now changed my mind, there we go. And my reasoning is, is very simple. For those of you who don't know me, one of my passions is, is coaching youth rugby. And when I assess a player, yes, I talk to them, yes, I review all their stats, yes, I watch their, their videos and so forth. But when I, to get a real idea of how they perform under pressure during a match, I watch them play live. I watch how they react to pressure, how they interact with their teammates, how their teammates react to them and so forth. And it's only really during a live game that one sees the true character and worth of the player and indeed the team as a whole. And the same, in my mind, applies to the, applies to the board. Um, you can do all the papers, all the interviews and all the other data one receives, all very, very important, but they do not show how a director or how that board operates in real life when it matters. And that's why I think we should uh, champion uh, board, uh, board observation, committee observation in Asia. I think that's very important. Uh, and I think that's, so I've sort of changed my mind on that, having thought about it very closely and my own experience. Thanks, Phil. So, I mean, it doesn't mean to say that uh, if we were to work with you, we would insist on it. We understand that there are cultural sensitivities uh, but we would also uh, help you understand the value that can come from that uh, and see how that progresses over time. So uh, don't worry, we wouldn't... We should, we should be the champion of it here. We'll be, the, we'll be at the vanguard here, as we are with many things. Anyway, so let's move on, Sarah. So I just thought to help um, frame this, I just uh, described the two main different approaches that are taken to board evaluation. Uh, certainly in the UK and, and certainly in terms of what we as independent audit do as leading board evaluators. Um, either, well there's two approaches. One is what we describe as interview based and this is if you like the fullest, uh, most thorough review. We do feel you get a lot more value from, from this opportunity to sit down and talk face to face with each individual director and with several of the senior management team who have significant interaction with the board. Um, so we'd always uh, recommend this as the uh, one where you get the most value, but we recognize there are certain constraints. Um, but first of all, just mentioning the interview-based approach, just very simple steps, really nothing particularly unusual about this. You, we agree the scope, it's important that the review is about you, so we have to understand your business context. So that's an important part of the first step and that is supported then by the second stage of reviewing documents. As I mentioned, we look at about a 12 month cycle of documents to get a picture of the company, but also so that when we get into the interviews, we're talking about you as a business. We're not just coming with a theoretical agenda or compliance checklist. We want this to be about what matters for good governance, good board governance in your business. We then observe the meetings, go away, draft the report, and then uh, discuss the draft report with the chairman. It's, that's very important. Uh, it's important that the board evaluation does not upset uh, things. Yeah, you've got to be very aware of sensitivities. 
so we need that opportunity to discuss or read the draft report with the chairman. It doesn't mean to say that independent, as independent reviewers, we change our, our message, but it's important that uh, we're not using language that might be unnecessarily, uh, cause, unnecessarily cause any difficulties, uh, but also gives the chairman an opportunity to understand our report in much greater depth than is possible when we get onto the last stage, which is meeting with the board to discuss the report. So that's a quick, very quick run through the approach we take. The alternative is externally facilitated self-assessment. And this is a combination of using our questionnaires. In our case, if you work with us, we use our proprietary tool, Thinking Board, which is an online questionnaire tool. Uh, but importantly, we then analyze results, we draft the report, and we then discuss it with the chair and with the board, and possibly include observation and possibly include paper review. Uh, so the difference between the two is that the first one is our assessment based on interviews. The second one is our assessment based on individual directors' self-assessment through a questionnaire. Both in the UK are regarded as externally facilitated and meet the requirements of the code. Uh, they're just different, both in terms of value um, and cost, of course, is important as well. Uh, the the questionnaire-based one being a lower cost than the interview-based one. So that this, I show this, this is the independent audit approach or alternative approaches. It's, in terms of the interview-based approach, you'll find a lot of evaluators taking a similar approach. And really it's a question of the, the feel and the style of the review and what comes out of it that matters rather than necessarily the process. But I hope that just gives you a bit of a, an overview of the sort of steps that we take in undertaking our reviews. So Sarah, just moving on. And the question of what do we look at? Now, we, we've got a model that we work within. Uh, this is the independent audit model. We split it into two different categories. On the left, you have what the board actually does. So, for example, without going through the whole thing, we look at uh, you know, how the board works on strategy, on people and culture, how it interacts with the management team, how it works on risk, that sort of thing. But then we also look at how the board actually does it. And so the dynamics of the board, the information and the support for the board, the way meetings work, the composition and skill sets on the board, uh, how the committees work and support the board, and also how the board is the evolution of the board in terms of the way it's developing through training, uh, building the, its own effectiveness, that sort of thing. Now, all of this is, in a sense, just a very simple framework. What actually matters is what happens underneath. And this is where the value of interviews and really rigorous questionnaires comes into play. Because what's key is understanding within this framework how people interact, the nature of the discussion, the information flow. Then it's important to know how all of this activity actually brings value and helps the business perform. Because if all of this is not actually helping the business, then it won't work well because management will be skeptical. They won't invest the time needed to make governance work well. And so it's, that essential, it's so essential that governance actually results in better performance. And also underlying all of this, you need to look at how all of this activity, how the, this framework, different components of the framework actually help you achieve your, your governance objectives. So even though this is the framework we work within, obviously it's the softer, more qualitative aspects of what actually emerges from all of this board activity that really makes a difference to whether or not a board is, is properly effective. So uh, that's quite difficult to get at, and that's why you, you come at it most effectively through interviews, but also asking the right questions in a questionnaire. It's not straightforward. Obviously, uh, I could talk for hours on this subject, and maybe we should organize a webinar much more around our model uh, in a few months' time. So uh, watch this space on that one. But what I really want to get onto now is just five minutes on what's actually happening following the crisis, because that's what this is mainly about. So Sarah, the next slide, please. So now how, how is the effectiveness equation changing with the crisis. Now there's a lot on this screen and I don't want to walk through each, uh, each block on this because the general message I want to give is that a lot 
has changed. And when we're doing evaluations, we need to look at this quite differently. In law, still looking at all of those core elements of it being an infected board, but then also looking at what has changed around these, what, let's take the four main categories. First of all, what has changed around stakeholders? A lot. Boards need to be in a position where they're restating how they work with stakeholders in relation to its vision, uh, who they're taking into account, how they're working with the community, how that's affecting the short term, the long term, what the impact is on their culture. So there's a lot happening that a board needs to revisit in terms of how it's interacting with stakeholders. Then obviously strategies are changing. It's a question of rebuilding the strategy. So I won't pick up on all of these points, but you know, what's this done to reputation? What, where does this leave the organization in terms of its environmental responsibilities, its social responsibility, its customers, its suppliers, a whole range of different angles, if not every angle probably, around strategy needs to be reconsidered for the post-pandemic environment. We all know that the macroeconomic impact has been immense. The impact on customers, on suppliers, immense. The, the legal implications, quite significant. So all of this needs rethinking. So the strategy will need rebuilding. So then around risk and control, it's a question of reassuring. Yeah, the, the risk profile, of course, has changed a lot, but that needs breaking down into all the different ways in which the risk profile has changed. For example, the regulatory angle will, of course, will be different, but also the people risks in terms of the individuals, employees' welfare, customers' welfare. There's all sorts of legal potential, the potential legal angles that from what we see are not getting the attention that they should in the boardroom now. For example, in relation to customer rights, what might be, what hits might there be in terms of claims around customer rights in the future? People are recognizing the, the cyber and IT security environments has of course changed with working from home and other workarounds that are essential at the moment. Then risk management itself is changing. The ability of the risk management function to actually get out into the organization and, and really see for themselves and discuss with people what is being done around risk managing risk is much, much more difficult when you're working from home. And similarly on the insurance side, you've got internal auditors who are not able to work in the same way as they normally do by getting into the field, talking with people, seeing the evidence for themselves. And the same applies to the external auditors. So, so much has changed around the risk and control environment. Audit committees, risk committees, and boards themselves need to stand back, take stock, and really understand what has changed and how they're going to respond to it. And then the operating model of the board itself needs reshaping. Yeah? Part of it is around the nature of the discussion. I mean, we've got some examples here, but obviously in leadership, in crisis, leadership from the board is crucial. But also what I describe as getting comfortable with ambiguity because uncertainty is now a huge part of board discussions. But it's also around virtual meetings and how they work and the impact that has on what's needed in terms of information. So again, without going into details, there's lots around the operating model that has changed. So boards cannot just carry on as before. They need to really stand back and ask themselves, what is different? And in order to work effectively post pandemic, what do we need to do differently? Uh, Sarah? So the main messages I want you to, would like you to take away are, firstly, boards have to work differently. They have to adapt their focus and their agendas. They have to look ahead to a very different new environment. And I think an important part of this, whether it's an internal evaluation or an external, it's, this evaluation has become so much more important in helping boards get this right. So that point, they, I mean, yeah. Sorry, Richard. Have you, I mean, have we know? Have you noticed that in your Zoom meetings that you've attended, your virtual meetings you've attended, that there it's those who have who the voices that are heard, uh, or more importantly, the voices that are not heard, were not heard so regularly in the main boardroom are even less heard over the virtual um, in the virtual meeting. And how do you get over that? Yes, well, exactly. Participation is a big issue. Um, 
because it is of, it's not as natural. Um, and it's, it's the, the role of the chairman and of the company secretary in actually seeing when this is happening and very actively, proactively making sure that participation is happening and that decisions are reached after appropriate participation from across those who are appearing on the screen. And this is becoming increasingly important as in some cases board companies are, are going back into offices. So you might put, see some members, particularly the management team, actually together in a room, albeit socially distanced, in a room yeah. uh, for participating in the meeting, but others, and mainly the non-executives, on screen, and that may alter the dynamic quite significantly. Um, so that's something definitely feel to watch out for. So what I'd just like to do um, before we just move on in the last 10, 15 minutes of questions is just to run the poll again, just to see that whether anything uh, I've said has, has changed your view. I mean, since everybody had a 100% view, a uh, solid view on the uh, last one. It's the same questions, um, but let's see whether your opinions have changed. Question, how much do you think the pandemic will affect the way the board works in the future? A lot, a bit, not much. Secondly, has the crisis changed the likelihood of you conducting a more in-depth board evaluation this year? Yes, much more likely, possibly a bit more likely. No, no change. So if you could just score those two questions and then we'll look at the result. Thanks, so let's just look at the, so, um, Okay, so the first one has uh, changed a little bit. So some people, want somebody's saying that actually the, the less convinced that it's going to change things in a big way, uh, but it's the same in terms of uh, like the field evaluation. Anyway, we don't try how much that tells us, but it can probably give a little bit of interaction with you. Uh, so let's, let's have some more interaction in terms of uh, any uh, questions and answers. Okay, we've got a question. Um, right. Uh, is there a publicly available source by jurisdiction where you can see which companies' boards have been externally reviewed? Or is this a disclosure that each company would include in their AR? Um, I can tell you what's happening in the UK and then uh, maybe okay. if you've got any views in terms of happening in those uh, jurisdictions in Asia. Um, sure. In the UK, um, it, you, the annual re, in the annual report, you are required to state who has conducted your review uh, and how that review has been done. So you can see not only whether it's externally reviewed, but you can also see whether it was done through interview, through questionnaire, or through some other form of external facilitation, for example, through a workshop because each company is required to explain how they have done the review. So it, there's no central source available that I'm aware of on that, uh, but it is there in the annual reports. Um, the, but whether Sorry. a company, um, is, so, and then, and then they have to state who their reviewer is. But having said that, there are there is certain uh, reviews done by consulting companies. For example, um, Spencer Stewart do a bit of a, a, or used to do, and I think, I'm not sure it's been done in the last few years, uh, a review of who's who's been doing what. Uh, so um, I think the easiest thing actually is on our check. I need to check with my marketing colleagues who where what the practice is on that. So then we'll get back to you with a man. In in, uh, yeah, in 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 Hong Kong and, and Singapore and Malaysia, it's actually it's actually just stated in the annual report. I I'm not aware of any. Uh, there might be an independent study, but I'm not aware. Of it. There's nothing mandated. Uh, as I said, in Malaysia, you have to state it in your board charter whether you're going to do an external review or not. So if so, that there's two ways of checking it. You can check the board charter, or after, and you can also then cross check it with the annual report. But uh, there's no central. Uh, register of um, external board reviews. I think we've got a, a, another one as well about yeah. um, board reviews are not mandated, how do external reviews come about? Uh, the, the simple answer to that is, is um, well I suppose it's, it's 
the two answers, a slightly cheekier answer is through education. Um, and that's kind of one of the chief things I'm doing now. And also a lot of the professional bodies, but normally it's the, it's the board themselves who uh, decide they've got to a stage where it's best practiced. Um, and as the, as the world is now so international and the investors in these larger companies, even in Asia where the family dominated ones, where, where they're large organizations, the pressure on them to comply with the best practice, whether it's uh, and do a board an external board evaluation every third year is quite significant. So the answer to that is it comes from external external sort of um, pressures on to comply with the best practice, but also most responsible boards of large organisations recognise the value of, um, of of external review every three years and internal one every two years. Again, the issue is perhaps more on the second tier companies where in Hong Kong, certainly in Hong Kong and uh, other places I, I'm aware of, we get the most uh, issues regarding uh, not complying fully with the uh, corporate governance code. And so perhaps we have to work on that. Yeah. yeah, what I would just add to that is, as I mentioned earlier, that we're seeing uh, a lot of the body valuations coming from non-listed companies. In part, they are responding to requirements. So, for example, they might be a charity, a large charity. And in the UK, the, the commissioner regulates charities or supervises charities is encouraging this. Um, but also certain public sector bodies and government departments are encouraging uh, or following guidelines from the government in order to do this. Um, so just across many different sectors, it's becoming the established uh, good practice but also might be expected and obviously the regulators pay an import, play an important part in that as well. Um, obviously the financial services regulators are keen to push that so even if there's not a formal requirement they are often very specifically telling financial institutions that they are required to undertake a board evaluation um, but also uh, other regulators for example in utilities companies are being told by their regulator and for example in the water industry their regulator is expecting it so there are all sorts of different regulatory pressures as well uh coming to play but it's interesting i mean we work with all sorts of and what, we, and what we do find here is often the regulators and um, set the tone and if they're doing the board evaluation then the larger companies tend to do it because the regulators sort of expect it and then it sort of trickles down a little bit. But so when the regulators here do play a massive part, as do uh, professional bodies here as well. Uh, because they, they well, what we haven't said is that it's because they find it useful, which is of and, course and the, most, yeah. <laughs> the, yes. the most important thing of all, they find it useful, yes. Um, uh, no, seriously, uh, it, it is. I mean, a lot of boards of various types, whether listed or not, are now doing this because they've experienced board evaluations and other boards. They've actually said, oh, actually, yeah, we did get something out of it. That has improved our lives as, as boards. Uh, we can see the value of it, uh, that there's practical things coming out of it. And hopefully we're working better as a, as a board in terms of dynamics and the way we work together as a team. I and mean, obviously there are many different types of improvements that are coming out of reviews. Um, but I think what, what why it's should... become standard in the UK over the last 12 to 15 years is simply now that people, once people got used to it, they then start recognising the benefits. One of the questions I, I have, and, and, and why did the, the big HR consultants sort of get pushed out in the UK um, from doing board evaluation? I mean, obviously, there was, was there, what was the conflict there that, that sort of mainly sort of made them to exit that, that area? Or? I think that's part of the concern. I mean, I, was, uh, I'm not, I don't want to, in a sense, criticise them. I'm sure they were doing very good, good work uh, and have been, and some of them still are. So, so don't please misinterpret what I'd say. But there was concern being expressed uh, in part by certain institutions as to whether or not uh, executive selection firms who were also working with the company um, on executive selection can actually uh, give an objective view um, whether the potentially there's, there's potential for conflict there. Um, 
So that, that was the main concern. Obviously, the regulators, to a degree, also share that concern. Um, so that, that's the main reason, I believe. But I'd say I don't want to suggest in, say, in explaining that, that, uh, that they don't do a very professional job. Um, but it's, that's, the, that's the angle. Yeah. There was an inbuilt, like the auditors, and when the auditors were doing consulting, there was an inbuilt conflict of interest there. So just one last question before we, uh, before we sign off. One question coming through. Um, somebody saying that uh, possibly boards will just go back to the way they worked before. Do we agree? I, I don't agree. I don't think they can. I mean, I think in, we talked a couple of weeks ago about board evaluation. Uh, sorry, uh, virtual board meetings. And I think that's clear that they... Um, they just can't just go back to in-person meetings for every meeting. It's likely to be a mix. But uh, so that's certainly obviously be a practical change there. But it, but as I explained from that rather detailed slide, that it can't change across so many different things: strategy, risk and control, the actual operating model, all of these things. The impact of a completely changed environment for customers, for suppliers, for regulators, for all of the stakeholders, and particularly for employees, means that a board can't go back to how it was working, um, and, and actually shouldn't. So it's a very interesting time. It'll be interesting to see what that actually means in practice. But I think it does give an opportunity, actually, to, to almost do away with some of the bad habits board we're getting into, and actually encourage some of the better habits in terms of we talked about participation and discussion, actually forcing a board to stand back and say, how might participation work better? How do we arrive at making decisions? Those sort of questions actually should make, force a change in the way boards work, and that would be good. So yes, they've, got to, they've got to see it as an opportunity. Exactly. To do that. Yeah. So I'd be disappointed if they did go back, but I don't think they can go back to how they're working. Um, again, we could probably talk for an hour or two on that, but uh, we've <laughs> run out of time at this point. So we'd just like to thank you for participating. Uh, we'll be in touch. We'll uh, share some of the output from today with you. And uh, we look forward to Phil having an opportunity to maintain contact with you uh, over the coming months. Well, yes, I hope everybody found it useful. Uh, just, every, just so you know, this is being recorded, so we will send out a recording and make it available to everyone. Our next seminar is scheduled for Wednesday, the 5th of August, at the same time, 4 PM. That's titled, uh, Are You Under Control? Um, Audit and Risk Oversight. There we go. There's all sorts of opportunities there. So please register for that one. Uh, as Richard said, if you'd like to discuss your board evaluation options or book a demo um, with, with me for our on, uh, online tool, Thinking Board, please contact me. I'm based in Hong Kong. I'm in your time zone. I'll be happy to have a chat virtually, unfortunately, from these days. And, uh, so, uh, and we'll talk about how we can help you with your board and uh, committee evaluation requirements. Uh, I think we are done. We will send out, as I said, we'll send out uh, the, um, the recording uh, link or to the link to the recording in the next uh, day or so. Okay. So we just wish you, you well and uh, say goodbye and stay safe. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.